So I want to thank everybody for tuning in. This video is going to be very deep. Uh, this is not just going to be simply about a gang because uh, this gang actually, the topic of this gang actually delves a lot into uh, religion and culture too. So we're going to go back in history a little bit uh, in this video and get into some very controversial deep topics uh, because the Mickey Cobras actually started as a different gang. Now, this is a gang that is one of the smaller gangs in Chicago, especially when it comes to black gangs. It's not as big as the GDs, the Stones, the Vice Lords, and some of these other gangs that are like spread out all over the city. This gang used to be primarily on the west side, but uh, they got moved to the south side, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But uh, this gang got a lot of, I would say, attention in the media starting probably about 10 years ago. Uh, and when I say attention, I mean like attention from outside the city. They've always been pretty well known here, but uh, it's, you know, the rap scene in Chicago is typically what gets like most of the attention. And by extension here, the rappers that become popular, most of them are gang members and whoever they're into it with, their rivals also gain a lot of attention when, when they do. When the BD started to get, you know, most of the attention about 10 years ago when the, when the whole drill wave started, you know, the the Tukaville, the, the GDs, the Brick Squad. And then another group that started to get a lot of attention was like 051 Young Money, which were mostly Mickey Cobras, although they have some other stuff mixed in with them. And uh, that was a gang that was beefing heavy, especially with 600, the BDs. Uh, and then another gang that at, at, at that time was clicked up with them. And today th that, that relationship is kind of complicated, but uh, a set called 800, uh, who are Mickey Cobras as well. And uh, so that they were kind of involved with, with Old Block and some of those other gangs too that were gaining a lot of attention. But another set of Mickey Cobras, th those are the, probably the most well-known, the two most well-known sets of Mickey Cobras now just because of, like I said, the beef they had with the BDs. But um, as far as other sets of Mickey Cobras, uh, the main ones that are like known besides them are down in, in the hundreds in Roseland. Uh, then they were beefing with Zach TV's neighborhood, although Zach TV was not a gang member. You know, he was from a neighborhood that had a gang there, 10-5 MMG. And uh, they beef with Wentworth Mob, and Wentworth Mob has Mickey Cobras in them. There's a set, I mean, they just refer to all Cobras basically as the snakes, but there's snakes that are part of Wentworth Mob. Although Wentworth Mob is not entirely Mickey Cobras, that's actually like a, a name of several sets that are down there off of Wentworth Avenue. So those are like probably the three most well-known, 800-051 and then, you know, the snakes in, in Wentworth Mob. And uh, it's not, like I said, it's not a real big gang. You're not going to find them spread all, all over the city and suburbs and all that kind of stuff. How did this uh, gang start? Well, it actually started as a different gang. And this is something that we're going to get uh, into uh, towards the end of the video because this touches on a very controversial cultural topic okay this is a primarily black gang the the mickey cobras uh in fact i don't know of any cobras that aren't black and um they started as a gang called the egyptian cobras now i just dropped a video a couple weeks ago on the moors and how they were related to the gang the stones and if you haven't seen that video go check that out because uh, this gets into kind of the creation of a lot of the black gangs that was taking place in like the pre-civil rights era. Okay, black people started gangbanging in Chicago mainly historically as a response to white gangs that were getting down on them and like, you know, robbing them, oppressing them in other ways just in the streets when they came up from the South. Okay, freed blacks in the South you know, that had just been freed from slavery, that were still living in the rural South. They were not gangbanging. They were not claiming sets. It's doubtful that any of them knew that that type of stuff existed or that knew what gangbanging was. But when they, when they came North uh, during the Great Migration, which started around the early uh, 20th century, uh, they encountered European immigrants that were doing that in the urban, in, in the urban ghettos of the North, in the industrial areas of the North. They had already been doing that and actually they had brought that gang culture over from the cities of Europe. Okay, so the European immigrants were doing that up there. The black people that were coming up saw what they were doing. And in particular, a lot of the influential black uh, gang leaders saw how these white immigrants were using gangs as a transition into politics. Okay, the white gangs were very connected with politics, especially the Irish. 
Um, and a lot of the, the Irish politicians were former gang members. And the Irish politicians also, uh, and some of the other politicians as well, would use street gangs like to, to get out the vote and, you know, do things for them. Even the mafia, Al Capone was connected with, you know, at one point politicians in Chicago and it, it was very interconnected, the, the streets and, and politics. So Larry Hoover specifically talked about this, you know, as being something that he wanted to do. He wanted to, you know, use the streets as a stepping stone into the legitimate business world and into politics. And this was a time in American history too, when on a national level, black people were fighting for equal rights, you know, uh, which, I mean, that's a struggle that continues to this day, but back then it was, it was way more even than it is today. I mean, they were not allowed to use the same schools and, you know, a lot of the same stuff in different parts of the country. So they were really fighting for these rights. And, uh, that, that struggle was very acute. If you haven't seen my interview with my mom, she grew up on the West side in the, in the fifties, uh, in, in Garfield park, as it was changing to a predominantly black neighborhood, go check that video out. She was, she talks about meeting uh, chief Malik actually during that time goes into some of the history with that. So that was what was going on, uh, at this time period. And a lot of these black gangs that were, that were forming around this time, were drawing on the cultures of African empires or African nations that proved to be a counterpoint against the narrative of white supremacy. I talk about this in my video with the Moors. White supremacists were pushing the narrative that whites were meant to dominate blacks because they were just inherently superior. And the proof of this was in history that whites had always dominated blacks and white nations had always dominated black nations. And the black historians were looking back in history and seeing that that was not true. There were these very powerful African empires that at some points had even dominated Europeans. And so they were pushing back against the white supremacist narrative. Now, the Moors, the, the group that I talked about uh, in my video about, uh, about them and with the Stones was one huge example of that because the Moors had obviously had colonized and enslaved Europeans for a period of about 700 years. So that was probably the biggest counterpoint uh, that they were using against, against white supremacy. But probably the second biggest, or I would say even as big as the Moors, was Egypt, okay, the, the Egyptian dynasties that existed in ancient times. And they would draw heavily on, on Egyptian culture and on Egyptian history and uh, symbols and even dress at some points. Um, anything having to do with ancient Egypt to a lot of uh, black organizations, both civil rights and in the streets, that were forming kind of as a, as a way to push back against uh, white oppression. And Egypt, even to this day, um, amongst a lot of pro-black groups that are not in the streets, is a big thing. It's, it's like a big deal. They're constantly talking about Egypt. They use names. They even get into like the ancient Egyptian uh, art and symbols and philosophy and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so it's, uh, it's very prominent. You see that interwoven with all their discourse. E even to this day, they constantly refer to Egypt and uh, is almost like the archetype uh, African empire with this nostalgic uh, view of it that they want to they want to return to like the the glory of ancient Egypt. We're going to talk about that uh, towards the end of the video. But this gang, uh, this street gang that formed around this time, was called the Egyptian Cobras. The guy who's widely credited with founding the Mickey Cobras was a guy named James Cogwell. Now I'm going to go kind of fast here through the through the early history, but uh, the Egyptian Cobras. At that particular time, like I said, we're, we're led by James Cogwell. But on the West Side, at that same time, another gang was forming, which I have talked about in numerous videos, and that is the Vice Lords. And the Vice Lords, th there were a lot of gangs like on the West Side forming at this time, but the Vice Lords kind of got everybody to eventually either flip Vice Lord or flip one of the other bigger gangs. Like there's sets of GDs and stuff now on the West Side. And uh, basically you had to either flip Vice Lord or flip something else. Uh, these smaller gangs eventually got uh, absorbed into the Vice Lords or just, like I said, forced to flip other stuff um, due to the Vice Lords. And, and this is one example of that. The Egyptian Cobras were forced out of the West Side. They lost their territory to the Vice Lords. And the Vice Lords eventually became the biggest gang on the West Side. And it remains that way till this day. Um, although today you have a lot of vice lords beefing with other vice lords. And so that whole thing is kind of, uh, it's kind of falling apart anyways. But uh, anyways, so when they 
left the west side, they didn't really spread out, I would say, evenly all over the city. They went to the south side primarily. They went to one particular part of the north side to the projects, but uh, mainly they went to the south side. And leadership of the gang at this time uh, changed, but stayed within the same family. And uh, James Cogwell had a younger brother named Mickey. So Mickey took control of the gang when they made the move to the south side. So at this time, they were still known as the Egyptian Cobra, though. So Mickey was personal friends with Chief Malik, uh, who's the, the leader of the who was the leader of the uh, of the Black Stones. So that was a primarily Southside gang too at that particular time, uh, and it remains a primarily Southside gang to this day. Although there's a lot of them over east, I would say. Although some people consider like the east side and the south side part of the same side, I consider it two separate sides, but. Southeast, uh, the stones are really strong down there, especially around Foster Park. So anyways, Mickey Cogwell was friends with Jeff Fort, okay? And uh, so the stones and and the Egyptian cobras kind of came together. And you'll see like a lot of the s same symbols within those gangs, uh, the pyramids and some of the, some of the same symbols you'll see with the stones and the cobras, okay? So they kind of form like an alliance and, and a friendship. So at this particular time, guys, the projects were still up. And for those of you younger guys who don't remember the days of the projects, Cabrini Green, I talk about those the most because that's the north side where, you know, where I'm from. So I was seeing those projects the most. But another, other groups of projects that were really notorious at that time were like the low-end projects in the Robert Taylor homes. So the, the Cobras took up a, a territory in the Robert Taylor homes. Okay, and then they also got part of Cabrini Green. So they became like a project gang partially. Okay, so they had like these territories in the projects. Now, Cabrini Green was obviously like one of the main bases of the GDs. And so the Stones, the GDs, you know, they were into it. So the Cobras were into it with the GDs too at this time, the Egyptian Cobras. Now, I don't know the exact year, I have to say, when this happened, but it was in the late 70s. Uh, Mickey Cogwell was killed, and this is when their name changed, okay, from Egyptian Cobras to Mickey Cobras, and they actually changed the name because of him in honor of the leader, but the gang is really the Egyptian Cobras, but they named it after their leader after he got killed. Today, you see the younger generation, like, naming blocks, you know, this world, that ville after fallen members. Well, the Cobras were, I think, the first ones really to do that. They named the whole gang after their fallen leader. Now, also around this time, uh, there had been a disagreement between the Stones and the Cobras about religion. Jeff Ford, Chief Malik, was really strong on Islam, on his Islamic beliefs. He wanted to take these gangs in, in a very Islamic direction and ba basically make them like these Islamic groups. And the Cobras didn't want to do that. Uh, Mickey Cogwell and, and these guys were kind of uh, against that. Uh, so the Black Peace Stones, like I said, were, were adopting that Islamic doctrine, although I would not call them like traditional Muslims by any stretch of the imagination. You know, like I said, they do a lot of stuff, drugs, you know, murder, robberies, extra, you know, sex outside of marriage that's against Islam. So, I mean, you can't really... You can't really say that they're Muslim as far as like the, the lifestyle that the majority of them follow. But now this was a controversial thing because the Stones were trying to model themselves after the Moors who were Muslim. The word Moor, as I mentioned in that other video, it was simply a European slang term referring to literally any Muslim in Europe, including European converts. Uh, but the Egyptians were not Muslim until the Arab invasions, okay, which occurred about five, six centuries uh, after Christ, before Christ in, in the BC era, they were mostly pagan, as was most of the world, polytheistic, um, worshipped multiple gods, uh, the sun and, and this kind of thing. And then after, uh, after Christ, Egypt was actually one of the first countries to convert to Christianity. Uh, as you can see, topographically, it's located you know, right across the sea there from Israel. So the early evangelists that spread out from uh, the Middle East... Uh, one of the first places that they hit was Egypt. And so the Egyptians actually were, were one of the earliest Christian nations. And uh, to this day, there's a large section of their population that's Coptic 
Orthodox Christian. Actually, the the monastic movement, if you guys are familiar with that, like monks and nuns, people that live in monasteries, people that live alone uh, in the wilderness and it, having a life of prayer, that practice began in Egypt. The founder of that movement was actually a, a guy named, well, the first person to do that was somebody named uh, St. Paul of Thebes, who was an Egyptian that uh, lived probably, I think, in the third century. And then St. Anthony uh, of Egypt was considered, he's considered like the founder of the monastic movement, lived around the same time. And so that movement grew out of Egypt. So when you see nuns, you know, teaching in these schools and monks uh, in the monasteries, that whole practice started in Egypt, like all the way back in the third century, third, fourth century uh, AD, when most of Europe, most of Western Europe and Northern Europe and, and uh, was still pagan at that time and uh, just wor worshiping nature. And then these evangelists from the Middle East came and said that, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, these are not gods. There's only one God once and he's a spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't have this form that you can see with your eyes or anything like that. And he permeates all of all of these things. And, and the, the natural world is just physical objects. It's not that these are not gods. So that was like a radical idea at that time, but Egypt was one of the first areas to accept that idea. They do have the crescent moon uh, with a star as one of their symbols, and uh, their colors are red, black, and green. And their fin ball, they run under the five, or, you know, I mean, that's pretty much dead now, but uh, back when that was still in force, they ran under the, under the five-point star. Uh, and some of the colors that, you know, you'll typically see them wearing is like red and black. I've never, uh, to be honest with you, I've never really in person seen the Cobras like all rocking their colors together. Back in the day, they may have done that. Today, they just wear like any colors. Like most of these black gangs, they just wear like any colors. Now the, the color banging thing is mostly dead, but uh, technically red, black, and green is their colors. And that's also the colors of like some other, that they can get confused with a lot of other gangs in Chicago who have like similar colors, but it's kind of interesting because they got pushed out by the Vice Lords, but then later joined the Finn, you know. So, anyways, but some of the stuff that they say though, they do they do say all is well. That's one of their slogans, which you'll also hear is like as a, as a Finn ball uh, slogan. They just say you know MC Love, um, the MCs for the Mickey Cobras, and then uh, another slogan they have is all is seen in the eye of the Cobra. And one of their symbols is the pyramid with the eye in it. Um, and, you know, they'll write the MC on it with the Cobra Snake. MCN, you might see Mickey Cobra Nation. Then, of course, the Five Point Star is, you know, still one of their symbols to this day. It's Five Point Star with the MCN letters on it. But anyways, when, when the projects came down, uh, which, you know, guys from my generation remember, uh, that took away a lot of their territory and a lot of their power as it did to really a lot of guys that were in the streets like the projects coming down was a big deal uh, that was probably the biggest event in the streets that's happened in my lifetime even bigger i would say than like the leaders going away uh, because like when larry hoover went away things were already kind of falling apart before that uh, but when the projects came down that that really really shook things up a lot of their leaders got booked as well and uh so they still have some territory though over in the Dearborn homes uh, and then also in Washington Park as you guys know Fuller Park and then like I said down in Roseland today the leaders are considered to be two guys especially although uh, to be honest with you I don't know too much about these guys or how much pull they actually have one is a guy whose street name is Dez and the other guy whose street name is Red Dez's government name is John Johnson Preston and uh, Red's government name is Otis McKenzie. Just like most of these gangs, they have a day that they that they celebrate. Just like the BDs have, you know, like for David Barksdale, or whatever his his day. The, the Mickey Cobras celebrate a, a day called Mick Day, and that's actually Mickey Cogwell's birthday. It's not the day that he was killed. Um, and that day is July twenty seventh. That's that's Mick Day. On that day, typically they'll have parties somewhere around Fuller Park. Now they're into it with obviously with THF, uh, Trigger Happy Family. So that I don't know if they're still doing that to this day, um, but that's something that they at least used to do. Like I said, today if it still goes on, I'm not sure. Um, I've I've never gone out over there on that day. Might be something I do sometime, but I, I don't know if they're still practicing that today. So where are the 
Egyptian cobras or Mickey cobras uh, today? What is the situation with them today? Well, like I said, they're mainly in those areas that I named, and their main rivals today are still the BDs, uh, and then down on the south side in, in the in Roseland in the hundreds, they're into it with the GDs down there. So BDs, GDs, folks, gangs, um, the Stones. You know, like I said, they had that disagreement over over Islam, but uh, I would not say that they're really into it with with Stones. Uh, and a lot of the gangs that were clicked up um, between like the Mickey Cobras. Like I said, today that's, I heard that situation has kind of changed a little bit. I don't know if they're still clicked up or not, but uh, 800, they're now beefing with uh, with M Block uh, down there, which is also, like I said, a lot of a lot of BDs. So mainly folks gangs uh, that they're into with, man. Uh, and like I said, as far as the literature and stuff like that, started off when a lot of these black gangs were trying to, you know, supposedly gain more rights for black people. Although even in the early days, a lot of them were preying on other black people. But today it's basically just a criminal gang, man. I mean, there's nothing really uplifting or positive about anything that they do as far as like the community down there. Uh, and as far as, you know, like uh, being any type of counterpoint to white supremacy today, it's it's like the exact opposite. It like helps reinforce, um, you know, black folks being kept down because everything that they do is uh, basically harming their own people in their own community. Uh, as you heard my mom refer to in my in my uh, interview with her when she was talking about the, the transformation of the West Side in the 50s and 60s, there's a lot of talk, you know, among sociologists about white flight during this time. But as she mentioned, there was also a flight of, of middle class black folks. Uh, the whites were not the only ones that left those neighborhoods. Um, the, the black folks who had two parent uh, family family homes that were you know, work, had two working parents making good living, getting good education, sending their kids to school and who were, you know, involved in making legitimate money. They all left as well on the West Side. And those neighborhoods, guys, have never really recovered from that. But as far as Larry Hoover's dream, you know, of, of black folks getting into politics through the streets, they didn't get into politics through the streets, but they ended up getting into politics anyways. And what he wanted to see happen, which was black folks you know, taking the control of the of the political positions in the city, that ended up happening anyways, without the streets. It's very ironic. There was a particular time during uh, Mayor Lifewood's term when almost every top position in the city of Chicago was filled by a black person. I mean, the head of education, uh, the head of fire, the head of CPD, uh, the state's attorney, the mayor, every top position in the city was filled by somebody that was black. And uh, I thought about Larry Hoover when I saw that. Because I said what he wanted to see happen has happened, but it didn't happen the way that he, that he was trying to get it to happen through the streets. These are all people that came from the legitimate business world. You know, they, they didn't start their careers by gangbanging. They did it uh, like the legal way. And it ended up happening. I mean, black folks by far, I would say, as, as an ethnic group today in the city have the most political power. So, you know, it's, it was just kind of ironic how history took its course. Um, without the direction that sometimes people were trying to direct it. You were with me in the early days, about nine, 10 years ago. Uh, you may have heard me speak on some of these guys. Uh, at that time, the drill wave was coming out and the people who were known outside the city were mainly only the rappers. You know, some of the, some of the early bloggers were talking about the rappers, but they weren't really talking about anybody that didn't rap. And then one dude came along and started to, started to change all that and snitch on everybody that was not rapping. And uh, so actually one of those guys who I won't name, I won't say his name specifically in, in uh, this video, but uh, he had seen a video that I had made about him and he was not a rapper. And his name, to my knowledge, had never been mentioned on the internet uh, before I said it in you know, one of my videos. And so he actually, he was the guy who told Zach TV about me um, because he had seen my video that I had made about him. And then Zach TV got in tune with me uh, like that. And that was something that I stopped doing, you know, obviously uh, years ago. But um, at that particular time, you know, I was airing out on the internet a lot of the Cobras. But the guys that I was talking about, though, were actually not Cobras. At least as far as what I heard, they were actually renegade members of other gangs, including BDs, who were with the Cobras. So that's the point that I'm uh, trying to make here. Some of these Cobra sets that you see are not like entirely Cobras. They've actually got members of guys that, from gangs that they're in tour with. 
And uh, so it's it's all messed up like that now. And an interesting plot twist. Uh, so I had stopped, you know, snitching on these guys and had stopped putting out any insider information. But then that guy who I'm, who I'm talking about that uh, who was a you know re renegade member of another set supposedly, who had told Zach to be about me, he got killed because he was hanging out with another gang that uh, he shouldn't have been hanging out with, uh, which was not uh, like part of his own set. And uh, he was at a party with them and got killed. And then I briefly came out of retirement uh, from snitching to snitch again on his killer and, and say who had killed him. Now that guy now who I had snitched on is, is currently incarcerated. And just so you know, the like everything else that I've said, you know, a lot of the info that I had put out in those snitching videos has since been debunked. And that, that information about who had killed him to, you know, it's just as flimsy and, and uh, potentially wrong as all the other information that I put out. Now, some other guys uh, in the streets have, you know, talked about that incident too. Yeah, that is just, uh, like I said, I was putting all that stuff out with, because these rumors that were not confirmed by any, you know, official source or anything like that. So uh, just so you guys know, I'm, you know, I'm putting that out there now. As far as, far as the guy who allegedly did it, you know, like I had apologized to everybody else that I was thinking on it. Same, same goes for him. Apologies to him. But we'll see what happens with that. We're still, this video, I don't know how this is going to age as far as that guy and, and, and what's going on with him. But um, all I can say is we'll see. Okay, we'll, we'll see. And everybody who's kind of in tune knows what I'm talking about. It's one of those situations where if you know, you know. And if you don't know, you probably don't need to know. But now we're going to get into probably the most controversial part of the video. And this is a topic that gets a lot of people very angry and very emotional, man. And that is the cultural identity of this gang, the Egyptian Cobras. So like I had mentioned before, man, uh, you know, a lot of these gangs were drawing on the cultures of these African empires that were, that were proving as counterpoints of white supremacy. The Moors was one, the Egyptians was another one. And the, the controversial question that um, arises as, as part of this is, the racial identity of the ancient Egyptians, because obviously the, the Egyptians today in the north of the country, in what in ancient times was referred to as Lower Egypt, uh, you have people that are primarily brown with like straight hair and have features that are very similar to people in the Middle East. Um, and then in the south of the country, around a region that has traditionally been referred to as Nubia, you have people that are primarily what we would consider black in the United States, although their hair type um, and some of their features are, are a little bit different. You can you can distinguish them pretty easily from most of the black folks that we have in the United States. They're you know primarily descended from West Africans. Their features and their hair type is a little is a little different, but um, I would say that you know definitely in the United States these people around in in the southern part of Egypt are what they would refer to as Upper Egypt. Uh, they would refer to these people as black, okay, Nubians or whatever, but they're considered Egyptians. So in the south, you got, you got mostly black folks, and in the north, you have primarily these tan or, or brown people. So the controversial question is, what were the ancient Egyptians? You know, was this really a, a black empire? Was this really a, a black kingdom that had, you know, dominated and colonized these other nations? And uh, proven the white supremacists' uh, point to be wrong. Was it really, you know, this black kingdom that had constructed all this really impressive architecture, the pyramids, the Sphinx, and and all this kind of stuff? So this is a this is a question that causes a big conflict to this day between the current inhabitants of Egypt, the, the modern Egyptians, and pro-blacks here in the United States. Uh, the pro-blacks almost unanimously assert that the ancient Egyptians were exclusively black. And I mean black, like 100% black, just like, you know, Sub-Saharan Africans. Uh, they were physically the same, same hair type, same, same physical features, same skin color, same everything. Any challenge to that is something that they flatly reject. Um, any assertion that the, that the modern Egyptians are descendants of the ancient Egyptians, that they reject that outright. They insist that the ancient Egyptians were, were black and that that black population was replaced by Arabs. Okay, now Egypt has actually been colonized by a number of, of 
groups since they had their dynasties. Okay, the, the Greeks had colonized them uh, in ancient times before Christ. The Romans then had colonized them. Uh, then the Byzantine Empire, which was the eastern half of the Roman Empire, had, had uh, included Egypt in, in its territories again. And then after the Byzantines, uh, the Arabs conquered Egypt. A number of groups have, have come through there. Okay, and uh, Egypt has actually been ruled by a number of dynasties that were not native to that country. Now, like I said, some of these were like Caucasian uh, empires from the, from the north, like Italy and Greece. But uh, one of them was from the south that was actually a black empire. And this is what re what's referred to as the age of the black pharaohs. Uh, one of the black kingdoms to the south, uh, the, the Kushites, had actually conquered Egypt and there were people that were undeniably black pharaohs that had been sitting on the throne of Egypt for some period of time. So what race were the ancient Egyptians? Well, the modern Egyptians assert that, you know, they are descended from the ancient Egyptians, although they're part Arab due to, and, and part, you know, they have residual percentages of DNA from all these groups that have conquered them. So, so what sources do we have to find this out? Well, one of the fortunate things for archeologists, for uh, geneticists and for scientists in general is that the ancient Egyptians did a, a fantastic job of preserving their dead or at least the dead of their royalty. So we have to this day a lot of uh, very well preserved intact, you know, skeletons and, and specimens from ancient Egyptian royalty. So as far as archaeological uh, and historical evidence, there's no evidence that the Arabs exterminated or replaced or kicked out the native Egyptians. Uh, that notion seems to be insinuated in some pro-black circles in the United States, but as far as historical evidence, there's no evidence of that. The Arab army that invaded Egypt uh, to take it from the Byzantines was only about 12,000 deep, and they actually conquered the country by just going city to city and, uh, and conquering the country little by little. But uh, so they mixed with the native Egyptian population, but they did not kill them off or replace them. DNA tests on modern Egyptians show that they're part Arab, that they have residual percentages of, of Arab DNA. And the percentages vary, but the majority of their DNA, the modern Egyptian DNA, is indigenous Egyptian. And the comparisons between the mummies uh, between the specimens that, that archaeologists have and the uh, and the modern Egyptians, show that the the gene pool has not changed sometimes as much as as people think. They're mostly the same as the ancient Egyptians, uh, and that that population in the north of the country or in Lower Egypt, as they as they would refer to, are more closely re related genetically to Western Asians than they are to Sub-Saharan Africans. Now. Like I said, the, the Egyptians in the south by Nubia have always been black and are black to this day. The Egyptians in the north are, are more related to Western Asians. And I'm talking now about the, the indigenous Egyptians. The, the, the DNA samples from the mummies reveal that, uh, at least the, the samples that they have. So as I had mentioned in my video on the Moors, there was a migration uh, literally thousands of years ago. Uh, according to archaeologists, from Western Asia into North Africa. And uh, so the Western Asians, the, the people who today, you know, populate the, uh, North Africa, comprise the, the ancient Egyptian population in the north. So those people are pr primarily brown skin with like straight hair, and they resemble physically, like I said, the, the modern Egyptians today. So the modern, the, the Egyptians, the modern Egyptians are correct when they say that their descendants of the ancient Egyptians, although they do have residual percentages from, like I said, the Arabs and from some from the Greeks and the, and the Italians as well for from the years that they were colonized. There was recently a big controversy between the, between the modern Egyptians and, uh, and some people here in the U.S. Uh, about the, there was a movie made about Cleopatra. Uh, Jada Pinkett had portrayed her as black. That question is actually a separate question from whether or not Cleopatra was black is actually a separate question from whether the ancient Egyptians were black because she, according to historical records, was not Egyptian. She was Macedonian or Greek. And she was part of the ruling dynasty at that particular time. So the the Egyptian, the modern Egyptians had complained about this and people defend their culture very fiercely. Culture is one of the most contentious uh, issues. Yeah, but all the evidence, archeological, historical, and genetic evidence points 
through the modern Egyptians being the descendants of the ancient Egyptians, mostly, mostly, although, like I said, there's, there's been some mixing. Um, but the idea that they were completely kicked out or replaced, uh, there's no, there's no evidence to support that, man. So it doesn't matter though, because they have the Egyptians in the South, you know, who are black and who've always been black. So it's been a multiracial country for a long time or what we would consider a multiracial country. Uh, sometimes they'll look at, you know, certain terms that were used in the ancient world, but the, the particular term that was used in the ancient uh, Greek-speaking world, and that, that included Egypt at that time, was uh, for a black person, was Ethiopian. Uh, they, they were not referred to as black back then. They, they were referred to as Ethiopians, and that's a Greek word that basically means sunburned face. It sounds like a diss, but it's not in our language. And that did, today that refers to one specific country, but back then that referred to, that was literally the word for any black person. And the word Ethiopia referred to land that was populated by black people. So uh, you'll often hear some of the Southern Egyptians referred to as Ethiopians. Uh, there's a famous saint uh, in the Orthodox Church and Moses the Ethiopian. He often gets confused with the prophet Moses, but he was actually actually an Egyptian from the south of the country. Uh, they call him St. Moses the Ethiopian. That's a very controversial topic, man. Egyptians, the modern Egyptians today and, and black Americans get into these arguments on social media about this. But uh, yeah, the, the modern Egyptians, though, they have a claim to their culture and their country. Anybody who's Egyptian, you know, you, you can comment in the, in the comment section. The Coptic Egyptians, from what I hear, have percentages of indigenous DNA that are even a little bit higher than, um, than the rest of the Egyptians. So uh, I'm putting up some photos in this video of uh, Egyptians comparing themselves to, to paintings from the ancient world. And you can see the Egyptians themselves depicted themselves as brown skin and they depicted the Nubians as black skin. And then they, they depicted some of the Libyans and some of the other groups as, as being white skin, but they depicted themselves as brown, which is the same thing that they are to this day. So uh, shout out to all the Egyptians, man, especially the Coptic Christian Egyptians. But as far as how that relates to the Mickey Cobras, and, uh, you know, like I said, in this day and age, I, I've never even heard them talk about it. It's basically just a street gang. That, to the in this day and age, it's rob, steal, kill, get high, you know, smash women, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's the same thing every other gang is on. It's your boy, when you see the report, uh,